Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca. He invented the Inc. Canadian Insider Index, which is used by the Horizons Canadian Insider Index ETF, a 2017 and 2018 fund data Fun Grade A Plus Award winner, his website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Jim, it's a pleasure to be back. Ted, the Bank of Canada has held its trend-setting rate at the same as it's been now for months. What does that tell us about the Bank of Canada and the Canadian economy? I think their decision to keep the rate on hold wasn't a big surprise, but the narrative around it probably caught a few people by surprise, and I think there's still a lot of folks in on Bay Street that are in denial. The uh, way the Bank of Canada pictured the economy, or you know, painted their picture of the economy, was one that was fairly upbeat. They did recognize, of course, their risks with trade, but I think that's well recognized in the market as well. Uh, I think what caught a lot of people by surprise was their characterization that Canada is doing all right in terms of growth prospects, that the Canadian consumer is doing all right. Uh, Dave Parkinson over at the Globe and Mail characterized it as basically, you know, the Bank of Canada painting, you know, a resilient uh, picture of Canadian consumers. I think this has caught a lot of people by surprise, but it hasn't really caught us by surprise, this sort of upbeat assessment by the Bank of Canada, because what we've been writing about, and, and people can go to CanadianInsider.com under our Market Center page and look at Canadian uh, Insider Insights, uh, it's our free newsletter, and back on November 27th in our Sunny Days for Alimentation Couchard edition, we talked about behavior we were seeing just, you know, within the Canadian Insider Index, uh, you know, insiders buying even more uh, shares in well, I would call inflation sensitive stocks, you know, things like, you know, Dream Office REIT, for example, where, you know, uh, a REIT, you know, if it has pricing power, you know, would benefit from inflation, you know, inflation from rents going up. You know, there's been a retail, you know, we've seen, we've seen some interesting activity in the retail space in Canada, you know, amongst insiders actually buying company shares. Now, if the consumer were in awful shape and, you know, had, had spent their last dime a long time ago, one would not expect to see that. So the outlook, I think, for the Canadian economy and certainly Canadian stocks going into 2020 is encouraging. It's not a slam dunk. And, of course, uh, there's always, uh, you know, surprises that hit. And we, you know, But we're all aware of the challenges that are faced the Canadian consumer with huge debts, uh, you know, a lot of your guests talk about that on, you know, on your show week after week. So I think, you know, your listeners are well aware of, of the challenges there. Uh, but how much of that is already priced into the market? I think quite a bit. What I would suggest is not priced into the market is a potential breakout in inflation. You know, I, I, if it hasn't been 10 years, Jim, it's been at least five years where I almost Every day, you can turn on the financial news, pick up a financial publication, and, and hear about how inflation's dead, how deflation is the big risk out there, how we've got demographics working against us. How, apparently, there's a savings glut. Apparently, although well, how that how you square that with Canadians, you know, household debt levels the way they are, I don't know. But apparently, there's a savings glut too that's going to keep prices down forever. You know, it's, and, and, and of course the world is awash in oil. I mean, so those are kind of the big kind of three things you keep hearing over and over again about, uh, about why you know, inflation will never come back. However, uh, you know, we will see. Uh, it's, it's what, it's what you're not expecting that often uh, catches markets by surprise. 
you know, uh, is it, is it a slam dunk that inflation is going to come back and be a surprise in 2020? No, but there are some things that are percolating along that aren't getting a lot of attention. Uh, for example, you know, we've seen the labor force participation rate in the United States move up slightly. It's kind of bottomed. Well, that would that would seem to indicate that maybe this demographic story that uh, you know. There's not a lot of activity going on in, in the population because they're getting older and not interested in working, and uh, you know maybe that has run its course. What will really be an interesting question in 2020? You know, has the shale boom in the United States run its course? You know, have we have we seen the peak uh, peak shale production? And uh, there's some indications that we maybe have in terms of at least their growth, uh, not necessarily production, but in terms of their growth. And the question is, has that been priced into the market? You know, or is the, the world is awash with oil narrative still the, the dominant factor? If it is not been priced into the market, if if the shale uh, sputtering as opposed to shale boom uh, is is still yet to be priced into the market, we could have a surprise on the crude oil price. And uh, as uh, Bob Hoy, uh, you know, very, um, uh, you know, astutely and uh, accurately, I think, uh, you know, has articulated on your show many times, you're kind of in a, you know, seasonal week period traditionally for crude. So, you know, you combine that with, you know, what we're going to see, I'm sure, in the next week or two of tax law selling in the oil patch. And we've talked about this on the show before. You know, I, I think it sets up for some potential opportunities in the oil space if you have any sense or any worry that we could inflation could come back and the oil price could surprise on the upside there's going to be a lot of bargains uh, in the Canadian oil patch you know even to allocate a small portion of you know of your you know depending on your circumstance you know of your strategy to uh, you know to mitigate the risk of, of oil prices going up so uh, you know I guess my point uh, there is that uh, I think a lot of a lot of Investors have heard this mantra over and over again. The world is awash with oil. Oil cannot possibly go up. That's been the right trade for many years now. However, we made a call in, in August that Canadian oil stocks had seen their bottom. In general, you know, broadly speaking, that has been the case. Those lows have held. So we will see tax loss selling is coming. I think, you know, some of the bigger names will hold the index up, but there's a lot of smaller names that are vulnerable to uh, tax loss selling. But, uh, you know, investors may want to take a real careful look at that and may provide some opportunity, if not short term, but also as a hedge against a possible uh, spike in the oil price. Actual construction on the Trans Mountain Pipeline has started. Is that good news for the Canadian oil patch? Yeah, there's another underreported story. Uh, you, you know, you found it, uh, but I, I haven't seen screaming headlines about that. And it's probably just as well so that we don't have... Uh, the rent a crowd protesters out, uh, you know, scrambling to uh, chain themselves to fences and the like. And you know, uh, last thing we need is another uh, another episode of Elizabeth May being hauled off the court uh, for uh, you know doing some uh, some protest work uh, where she shouldn't be. But it's happening, you know. And I don't think that's fully uh, fully discounted in Canadian oil patch share prices either. Well, we've heard so many stories about uh, people with degrees in geology being forced to drive Uber in Calgary and now uh, a mass exodus of skilled Canadian workers to Texas to work in their oil patch. Can those jobs or that expertise be replaced if there is an uptick in the Canadian uh, oil patch? Well, I'm not an expert, obviously, on uh, HR and the oil patch, but I, you know, I would think that uh, that if that if that expertise went down south, under the right circumstances, it would come back. But it's not, uh, you know, it's, it was not easy to to bring somebody back once you've lost them. However, I think there's still, uh, you know, spare capacity in terms of the, the labor pool. Unfortunately, you know, in the oil patch, but uh, we may see that being used up uh, quite uh, quickly and. It, it will be 2020. I think is going to be a very interesting year, Jim. Very interesting, because we've got this this uh, assumed gloom that uh, Western Canada, and I mean, you know, the three prairie provinces for the most part are going to underperform everyone else in Canada. Meanwhile, the Canadian consumer is on their back, and you know, so basically, you know, the Canadian economy, you want to avoid it. Canadian stocks, you want to avoid it because everything's awful here. I hear that all the time. 
uh, you know, from various commentators. Uh, but, you know, the, the Canadian economy doesn't roll over and it's, you know, it seems to be doing just fine. So, you know, there is, I think, good opportunity in Canadian stocks, you know, in the 2020. Now, that being said, you know, uh, I thought that we were going to be heading for a Canadian late cycle rally back in 2018 in the, in, in the spring. That didn't happen. Well, what happened? Why did it get derailed? We've done a lot of work trying to, think about like figure out why what happened everything was going great up until up until the sort of late spring and all of a sudden global inflation expectations collapsed uh, and that's very bad for the Canadian market in general and certainly uh, mid-cap Canadian stocks but I think we've seen a sea change here and we are monitoring very closely what's happened to Canadian stocks and Canadian center index since October 15th and that's when Jerome Powell restarted, you know, uh, buying assets. So that's basically when not QE came in into into yeah into action, where they started buying their sixty billion a month in treasury bills. That is very commodity friendly, as we've talked about in the show in the past, as opposed to the old old fashioned QE, the Bernanke QE, which was you know very financial asset friendly, real estate friendly. This is much more commodity friendly and that's this is going to play out over the next few months potentially and so far as of yesterday as of um as of wednesday the sorry as of tuesday the uh canadian insider index since october 15th you know has outperformed the s p 500 uh, by uh by four percent so i think it gave back a little bit uh in terms of relative performance today uh, the S&P had a good day, and it, it seems to be going up and down based off these crazy trade headlines, which is, you know, just, I think, machine-driven. But fundamentally, if you know, if we do get an uptick in inflation, it's good news for Canadian stocks. It's not going to be so great news for American stocks, and it's also not going to be good news for those Canadian stocks that are sensitive to long-term interest rates on the downside. And in particular, and this is something we've been writing about this week quite a bit uh, to our uh, subscribers and users is uh, software stocks you know they're so they're they're quite vulnerable should uh, long term bond yields begin to creep up on expectations of greater inflation we'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, uh, we've seen the new Trudeau cabinet come in. We have the same finance minister. Does that mean we're going to see the same policies and uh, attitude of the federal government towards uh, the economy and the, especially small business? I, I think it'll be a different attitude, but not necessarily because of the players, but because of the fact they're a minority government, so they'll have to cut deals. So sometimes they'll be cutting deals with the NDP. Sometimes they'll be cutting deals with the conservatives. So it's going to be a more pragmatic approach, which I think is, is very good with this liberal government because it didn't take them long under the last four years, the previous mandate they had to become very ideological. And that, you know, they, that's when things started going off the rails, uh, I thought for them and, and their, their policies. They, they got off to a, an okay start at the beginning, but then they, then they started really kind of kicking in their, their ideology. But, they, they won't be able to be as ideological this time with uh, a minority government. So from that perspective, uh, it's probably a positive that they, you know, that they will be having to change and they're, they'll be able to have to be hopefully a little bit more pragmatic towards small business and, uh, their spending, uh, habits. So, I mean, the risk is, of course, is that they, they run to the NDP 
and the uh, the Green Party and the and the bloc to to do all sorts of crazy spending and the like. And I'm sure we're going to get our fair share of that. But on the other hand, too, on some difficult decisions that uh, you know require some tough you know some tough moves, whether it's on national security or you know even you know things like the the pipeline, the the Trans Mountain pipeline. Should you know somebody in Parliament try to somebody on the left try and stop it, you know, they would have the conservatives there to just kind of deal with. So I think it's going to be a more pragmatic approach. And uh, that's another reason, I think, to be optimistic about the Canadian economy going forward, that uh, because of a minority government, we have we should have a smaller chance of dumb policies coming into play. But of course, it doesn't rule it out, <laughs> unfortunately, because uh, we have so many, so many uh, sort of Left wing spend, uh, you know, spend uh, our future uh, future tax dollars uh, now. Parties in, in parliament, so yeah, you could get some bad policies. But no, on balance, I, I I would prefer I prefer the kind of minority situation that we have now than the majority that we had in the previous. I think that's a, a better better place for us to be. Was it a surprise to see Ontario Premier Doug Ford try to play peacemaker, get everybody together? To get on the same page. I like his attitude. We're all Canadians and it doesn't help anyone to hurt somebody else. Well, you know, he's uh, assuming the role, the traditional role of an Ontario premier and good for him, you know, and I, and I think, uh, you know, that he's got an eye on his next election uh, prospects, which aren't that great right now, but fortunately he doesn't have an opponent on in the Liberals, but, uh, you know, they, they've stumbled a bit. And so, I, you know, I think he's probably trying to show that he, uh, Another side to his uh, his administration, which is which is a good thing. So you know, and, but from you know from an, an investor's perspective, Jim, you know, politics is uh, Canadian politics isn't really going to matter too much. The American politics is going to be much more important. Uh, you know, I think uh, we're going to have to see how the U.S. Democratic primary uh, unfolds. That could suck a lot of capital out of the U.S. because of uncertainty until that gets resolved. And Canada could benefit, particularly if we have uh, long-term interest rates starting to creep up. If you start having a competition um, between Trump and the Democratic nominees, and you know potential nominees as to who can spend the most money to help the most people, you know you, you could see the bond market sell off. So we're going to have a very interesting 2020. And it, it, I, the way it's shaping up, you know, unless we get a, a, a major credit event, and I mean by that, you know, big bankruptcy somewhere uh, that, that impacts the global financial system, uh, you know, I think uh, Canadian stocks are, are, you know, are looking pretty good here. So, you know, keep your eye on the Canadian Insider Index uh, for sure, and uh, you know, we'll be uh, we'll be keeping our eye on some of those key themes into the new year uh, at CanadianInsider.com. You'll want to, you know, take a look at our newsletter because we're going to be looking at keeping very, you know, close tabs on the uh, yield curve and whether the long-term rates are moving higher or whether, you know, whether this is all just one big fake out and we're really, you know, into a few more years of really what we had in the past, that is kind of ho-hum rates, uh, you know, central bank manipulation of markets that, you know, you know, keep distorting things, you know, you know, keep, you know, so we're, we're going to keep our eye on that and, Right now, you know, I, all I all I'm willing to predict for 2020 is probably going to be quite an exciting year, and it's probably going to be more exciting than 2019. I think you know 2019 it was kind of an anxious year. Where will there be a trade deal? Will there not be a trade deal? Will the Fed cut? Will the won't the Fed cut? You know, I think those you know those those kind of decisions are kind of already been baked in the cake. They'll probably you know, the Fed is cutting, but now the Fed is buying back, you know, uh, buying assets. It's inflating its balance sheet. There's probably going to be, you know, a uh, uh, token trade deal come through. The question is, what about all the unknowns, Jim? And that's why 2020 is going to be uh, going to be so good. Uh, you know, in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, things to write about. Anyway, I don't know about investing, but it's going to be it's going to be entertaining. Uh, I should put it that way. In terms of being good, it'll be uh, it'll be uh, there'll be a lot to talk about in 2020, and it'll be a lot more uh, it'll be a lot more black and white. I think in terms of what's happening than what we saw in 2019. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. 
Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, is business concerned about the city of Vancouver uh, hiking business property taxes nearly 10% this year? Well, good thing, Jim, there's no inflation, right? Because uh, otherwise, uh, this, this 9 or 10%, uh, you know, might actually uh, mean something. But uh, no, it's outrageous. It's an outrageous uh, situation. But uh, look, you know, this is the council that <laughs> Vancouver voters chose. Uh, and they chose a, a council that's going to fight the climate emergency at the local level. And now this is what they're getting. So, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. And, uh, but to be quite honest with you, I mean, this is just absolute war on small family businesses. You know, I just don't get it, Jim. You know, all these, uh, you know, the, this climate emergency stuff. Yes, you know, we do have a problem, but, you know, uh, to go it alone as a city of Vancouver and, do your own thing, uh, you know, uh, not part of an integrated strategy uh, federally, you know, because it's really a federal issue here. And I know we sh- it's something we, we all have to be concerned about, but when it comes to public policy, it's really environment is is primarily a federal issue, a provincial issue as well in, you know, in, in areas where it has jurisdiction. But, you know, when it comes to meeting our international obligations it's ottawa and you know if they haven't you know i mean somebody should ask justin trudeau why don't you have an urban strategy in terms of climate change why you know and why is vancouver going off on its own doing all this uh crazy stuff you know and in the meantime while they're doing all this climate emergency stuff they're killing these small business small family businesses who cannot possibly afford you know to pay these out you know these these crazy business property taxes you know how many Mom and pop coffee shops are there left in Vancouver? You know, sort of certainly west of Main Street, there's probably a handful. You know, maybe there's ten, maybe there's five, maybe there's two. I mean, all you've got left are these chains, these global chains, who just sort of look at it as a cost of doing business, and they put it into their spreadsheets in their head office, and you know they figure out a way to deal with it. Well, you know, when you're a mom and pop operation, and all of a sudden you're hit with another six hundred dollar bill. Uh, that you hadn't planned for, it means something. But, you know, these city councillors, these politicians, they don't know that, right? They don't care. They're used to getting their paychecks, and to them, politics is just another gig. They have no clue about meeting payrolls. They have no clue, you know, the impact that these these business property taxes have on the, you know, little business owners. And, you know, it's, it's just it's just hypocrisy to to hear these people talk about fighting climate emergency when at the same time they're willing to clobber you know mom and pop small businesses you know so don't give me this stuff about oh yeah well we believe in sort of local this and local that local sourcing and local you know local agriculture meanwhile you're 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 killing off uh little businesses i mean it's just it's just the hypocrisy jim is what really gets me and it's i know this is a bit of a rant but uh you know i know i know a number of small business owners in in vancouver and you know the it, the number of small business owners that I do know is getting smaller and smaller because they're just giving up. You know, a lot of them are just giving up. So, um, you know, it, it'll, it'll be more change now in Vancouver. And uh, I guess uh, then um, Vancouver City Council can, can come up with an audit that they can go audit Starbucks and all these other, you know, large chains to make sure that they're uh, fighting the climate emergency uh, because they'll be the only ones left uh, to do the job and all the mom and pop shops uh, will be gone, you know. Well, I think one of the things that's most damaging to small business is being taxed on your business potential, not on what your business is actually doing. So 
if you're an area that perhaps you could be a 70 story tower, you're being taxed like you're a 70 story tower and not a two story uh, chocolate shop. There needs to be a complete overhaul of the tax system in British Columbia from from the local level right up, you know, to the the provincial level. But you you, you haven't you don't you do not have the courage of politicians to want to do that and it's, it hasn't been done right it's always been done piecemeal and even on the federal level i mean that's what got justin trudeau into such problems they decided to tackle a little bit about the small business um uh, taxes uh in their first year but you know they left everything else the same well you know if you're going to you're going to gun after one aspect of the small business shouldn't you be gunning after large business too at the same time and and rejigging things to make it all fair but no, you know, they, they think taking it little bits at a time. So taking a, you know, taking a sliver out of small business here and then taking a chunk out of them there, that that's the way to do. But it's a cowardly way of doing it. And, you know, in, in, until you get a party that's, uh, I think, you know, this is something that conservatives should really federally and also, you know, the, the free enterprise side in British Columbia, they should really get their heads around tax reform, you know, because, no one else is doing it because everyone's too scared to do it. Well, at some point, you know, it's going to cry out for for a solution. And if no one's there with the uh, with the answer, then the chances of the wrong answer being applied are are there. So uh, let's uh, let's hope let's hope that we'll get some 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 leadership uh, that uh, will will you know. Uh, take the initiative here and 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 tackle things like that. Like like, how should we be taxing businesses? You know what? Uh, you know how should we, should we really be taxing people going to work? You know, is that really what we want to do? do? Do we want to discourage people from going to work, or do we want to discourage you know people from from uh, spending you know a, a lot of money on 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 things that they don't really need uh, that may, you know, that we, then we have to throw out in the garbage. Right. So, you know, uh, the people have to, get the, uh, policymakers have to get their head around that and doing all this kind of patch, patch, uh, meal sort of, uh, stuff. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, as long as the voters let them get away with it, they'll, that's what they'll keep doing. But, you know, I think the conservatives and the BC liberals should have received a message that if they want to move forward, they got to do a little bit deeper thinking, and hopefully that message is getting through. And, you know, it would be great if they did because I think there's a huge opportunity there to, to you know, come up with a common sense approach to taxation. So we'll have to see if that uh, if that's in the cards anytime soon. That can be on the wish list for 2020, Jim, uh, that uh, we get uh, we get some focus on tax reform. But uh, that, that wouldn't be on my top ten of expectations uh, for the new year, that's for sure. And Ted, do you have a holiday bonus for our listeners? Well, that's right. Until the end of the year, uh, those uh, listeners who are interested in joining our Canadian Insider Club as an ultra member, which means you get everything on the site, including our uh, video interviews and, and videos, along with all you know the core ink research uh, research uh, pieces, you can go to our website and subscribe. But use a coupon code. Black box. That's all one word in capitals, and use that at checkout. Uh, it'll when you get to the checkout, it'll have the normal price. But if you put in a black box, you will save ninety nine dollars. So and that ninety nine dollars will stick with you until you cancel your annual uh, membership, which you can do any time. But uh, yeah, enjoy ninety nine dollars a, a, a year for life off of a Canadian Insider Club Ultra membership by using coupon code Black Box, all capitals. Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Jim, it's my pleasure. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca. His website, CanadianInsider.com. If you have any questions for Ted, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.